General Manager Joe Douglas has given us a whole mess of sound clips this week. What's happening, everybody? This is Green Bean. Welcome back to another video. This is a good one. I always love to hear what our general manager is thinking. Now, he's good enough that he's not going to give us everything, of course. He's not going to show his hand, as we like to say. But I always like hearing stuff right from Joe Douglas's mouth. I appreciate it, and I think it makes a little bit more sense than maybe listening to a lot of other people, especially in our history. But before we get into all that, I want to remind you of a couple things. If it's your first time here, thanks for popping in, and go ahead and hit that like, that little thumbs up button underneath the video, go ahead and hit that like button, and if you haven't subscribed, go ahead and hit that rectangular subscribe button. That means the world. It changes everything and it benefits the channel and I appreciate it. If you guys are looking for exclusive green bean content, literally weekly private get togethers and all that stuff, join the bean baggers by clicking on my Patreon link right below this video and come on in. The water's warm. So, Let's get into some Joe Douglas stuff. So down there at the NFL owners meetings in Palm Beach, Florida, Joe Douglas was able to be grabbed by a few reporters and they asked him some questions. And there are some interesting answers. And I think we could make sense out of some stuff and try to read between the lines, which is something that we try to do here. So the first thing is the overarching theme for free agency. Joe Douglas has a little bit of a reputation for being frugal maybe even has the label of being cheap by many Jets fans out there. But he really put this in perspective today for us. And he said, the New York Jets want to be aggressive, but they want to avoid being reckless. What an interesting way to say it. And you can see the last few years, Joe Douglas came in and he's been tasked with cleaning this joint, right? That's that's the thing that a lot of Jets fans, uh, with our 10 years of never winning anything, we just want something good. And it can be difficult to have patience while somebody cleans out the place before you can move in, so to speak. Joe Douglas has gone to great lengths to kind of gut this joint by getting rid of players that the previous regime thought would be pillars, guys like Sam Darnold, Chris Herndon, Jamal Adams, Leo Williams, those types of guys. He got rid of all those guys for draft picks, compiled a bunch of additional draft assets, and then he had to take some time to get rid of all the dead cap, the bad contracts, the Le'Veon Bells, the Quincy Anunwas, the Tremaine Johnsons of the world. So this year he has the money and he has the draft picks. So he does seem to be going out there and being a little bit more pointed, and maybe even we could use the word aggressive out there. He brought in two free agent tight ends, which I think surprised most people. We all thought we'd get one, but two, little bit outside of what we thought was going to be happening. He went out there and got a right tackle, a pro, I'm sorry, a right guard, a pro bowl level right guard. He got an edge rusher. He got a cornerback. He got a safety. And these contracts, we, I, you know, look, we can't really call them bargain basement, you know, one year, $3 million contracts. That's not what he's doing this year. Now that he has the money, the place is pretty much clean. You can argue that the CJ Mosley contract is still an albatross of, uh, you know, of course, but other than that, the place is clean and Joe Douglas has the draft capital. So he goes out there and he and he really spends I think a lot more than some Jets fans thought that he was capable of spending with Lake and Tomlinson, Uzoma, DJ Reed, Jordan Whitehead, not terrible contracts but not cheap contracts. So he talks about being aggressive. I think we see that, but he doesn't want to be reckless. And he went on to say that there were a few situations with a few players that they were in there right to the end and they thought it was bordering on being reckless. So they had to stand down. What an interesting way to say it. We were there till the end. It was bordering being reckless. Like he said, look, we always keep some wiggle room in there, you know, to be able to negotiate with people. But it was bordering reckless. So we had to stand down. Now we can speculate on which players those are. We don't really know. Maybe it was a wide receiver out there. Maybe it was somebody else. We just don't know. Maybe it was Devontae Adams. You know, who knows? We don't know exactly who the players are. But he did say that he was out there to the last moment. It was bordering being reckless. They made the decision, you know what? 
we're out. Which, you know, you can look at the Tyreek Hill thing when we look for an example of being aggressive. Even though we didn't give up a first-round pick in the, in our trade offer, we did give up two really high seconds, 35, 38, and 69, as we know by now, are actually more draft value than even the first round in the five picks that Miami gave up. So they are valuable picks. And you can you could definitely say that's aggressive, giving up our really the center of our draft, keeping the firsts and the fourths. But that is the second, third round are gone. That definitely constitutes being aggressive. So what else did he say here? He was asked about Makai Becton, and he said, where do you envision him? Is he is he going to start on the left side? Is he this? Is he that with George Fitt? And he said that we are going into the draft absolutely thinking that Makai Becton is one of our starting tackles. Did not say starting left tackle, which as we know, that's why Makai Becton was drafted. That's the position he was drafted to be. That's what he played his rookie year. And that's what he started at before getting injured last year. So interesting shift. And I think this goes really well with what Sala is saying. What Sala is doing from my perspective is trying to motivate Makai Becton, trying to let him know, hey, you're a high draft pick. You're, you know, top 15 draft pick. You had a good rookie season. You neutralized Nick Bosa and Joey Bosa in the game against Sala with Nick Bosa. You neutralized some guys. You have a lot of talent. But guess what? You were injured. George Fant played well enough to have the starting left tackle job. And if you want it, you got to come get it. Joe Douglas and Robert Sala are lockstep enough that Joe Douglas wasn't going to undermine what Sala's doing and what Sala's put out there. And it shows that they are one and the same in their thinking, which is really, really cool. Whether or not Makai Becton plays left tackle or right tackle, it doesn't matter so much to me. I am more thinking that that Makai Becton will win the starting left tackle job. But if they want to keep Fant over there and they want to put Makai Becton on the right side, I really don't care as long as we have our two starting tackles. And it would be really interesting because another thing he talked about was Sala and John Benton's decision to move AVT to the right guard spot and keep Lake and Tomlinson, our new draft pick from the 49ers, in his traditional left tackle spot. Now, Lake and Tomlinson played right guard. I said guard tackled. I meant right guard. Lake and Tomlinson played right guard all through college, so it's not a big thing, but his whole NFL career, he's been playing left guard. So the way that they're seeing it, and I think makes a lot of sense, this guy's a Pro Bowl level left guard. He's been doing it for years, and we know what he is. AVT's going into his second year. He played versatile in college. That's all well and good. Let's just move him over. But wouldn't that be really interesting if the Smash Bros, which I'm still saying is the reason it all went to shit, you can't make boasts before you do anything. Boast before actions terrible move. Hopefully our guys learn that. But remember, the Smash Brothers were really exciting the fan base with being able to play together. Now, if they both get moved to the right side, wouldn't that be a fascinating turn of events? Wouldn't that be interesting? So we'll see how that goes. But I think the most interesting piece to look at is Joe Douglas definitely did not commit to Mekhi Becting being on the left side. He said, we're going into the draft with Mekhi Becting being one of our starting tackles. But he left the door open for what Sal is doing to maybe move Mekhi Becton over to the right side if he doesn't beat out Fant for that left tackle position. So the final thing I'll mention is he was asked about the building of the team through the draft, and he went on to say that having four picks in the top 38, if we do this right, this could really be special. You see, this is what's so cool. We have a general manager that understands. Now, Theoretically, all general managers understand, right? It's how they got there. They're football guys. But that's not really the case with the New York Jets. Don't forget, we had Mike McCagden, who really shouldn't have been in that position anyway. He's more of a scout to begin with. But that aside, the previous two general managers were accountants. They weren't even football guys. So the idea that they really understand how to build a team, you can argue that they don't, which is why Idzik leaned on Rex so much and all that jazz. Joe Douglas understands. Look, we have four top 38 picks. This is a rare occurrence. We worked for years and got rid of players to make this happen. Four top 38 picks. This is a unique opportunity that does not come around very often, and we need to capitalize on it. If we do this right, 
this could really be special. And he's correct because, guys, it's not just having two firsts and two seconds. It's having two top 10 firsts and two top 10 seconds. That first 10 or 15 picks in the second round can really be almost as valuable as the front end of the first round. It's the guys in the first round that just happened to slide through. Every single year we see fantastic players make it to the first few picks of the second round. We'll be there with our our net just waiting for guys to pop through a la Elijah Moore last year. Guys that are absolutely considered first round picks always make it to pick 33 to 36 and we're going to be able to do that right this year. It's all about maximizing the value. Taking the best players that we possibly can and being able to fill some holes with those players, whether it's uh, an edge rusher, a cornerback, a safety, linebackers, wide receivers, running backs, even getting another tight end. You could really bolster this team, help Zach Wilson out, help this 32nd ranked defense out. And Joe Douglas has a fantastic grasp of the magnitude of this opportunity. So, hey, What do you think of what Joe Douglas is saying? Is it more baloney? You think it's just GM speak? Or do you see some of the things that I'm seeing that we're being told a few things here? Maybe Joe Douglas is letting us know a little bit of their thinking, which I find fascinating. I can't wait to hear your comments in the comment section. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And I hope you're having a fantastic day. And go Jets!